This video is brought to you by Squarespace. A question I get asked a lot is what gear I use to listen to Beatles music on. And that's a fair question. So in this video, I'm going to show you both the modern and vintage equipment I use to do just that. Oh, and I'll also tell you the fascinating story behind this red telephone. Vinyl records themselves have hardly changed at all over the past 60 years, but the equipment we listen to them on has. Back in the 1960s, most teenagers listened to their 45s or albums on players like this. And it was players like this that engineers had in mind when they were mixing and cutting pop records back then. And their goal was to make records sound as loud as possible without jumping. And whilst not being very hi-fi, they certainly have a primitive energy to them which only adds to the excitement of records from that period. But clearly, with tone arms weighing over three times that of a modern deck, these players ruined your records in no time at all. My vinyl journey began with a player similar to that, which was my mother's pink Dansett Bermuda. Dansett produced a number of models which were in almost every British teenager's bedroom in the 1960s, and with their stackable spindles and high output crystal cartridges, made records truly exciting to listen to. For those fans back then, it wasn't about the quality of the sound, it was all about the music, which is something which some people forget about these days. The turntable I use most today is the one behind me, which is the British-made Garrett 401. Launched in 1965 to replace the utilitarian-looking 301, the 401's design was ahead of its time. It had style and quality in abundance, and was a popular choice for musicians of the day. Like Jimi Hendrix here, for example. And Paul McCartney still has one in his home listening room today. The 401 was Garrard's last quality turntable, and sold 74,000 units before it was discontinued in 1977. My 401 dates from March 1970, and although it now sits in a modern plinth, it's serviced by a vintage SME 3009 arm of the early, unimproved variety. These 401s have shot up in value over recent years, and a nice working example could cost you a thousand pounds today, with totally restored examples making double that. I have two cartridges which I run on this deck. One is a vintage Shaw V15 Type 3, and the other is made by a Canadian company called Pure Fidelity, which was founded in 2015 by dedicated audiophile and vinyl enthusiast John Stratton. Named the Stratos, it's a beautifully designed moving coil cartridge fashioned from an aluminum alloy called Duralumin. Pure Fidelity also makes superb hybrid turntables, combining the best elements of high mass turntables and suspended decks, and are, according to reviews I've read, outstanding on every level. I'll put a link in the description to them and the Stratos, so you can check them out for yourself. My other turntable, which you may have seen in past videos, is the more up-to-date Project Debut Carbon Esprit. It's a fine belt drive deck, which can also play 78s, and I fitted mine with an Autophon 2M cartridge with one of their blue styluses. Now, as the Autophon is a moving magnet cartridge, I've hooked it up to a Rega Phono Phono stage. But as the Stratos is a low output moving coil cartridge, it needs a different Phono stage, which is the similar looking, but also great sounding Rega Phono MC Mark III. Now, due to space limitations, I've always had integrated amps in my setup, the best of which was an Accuphase 301, which I wish I still had. However, I do have its predecessor, the E202 from 1974, which not only sounds great, but with its big VU meters looks great too. Although it's in working order, it needs recapping. Now, I've bought a kit to do that, but I need to sharpen up my soldering skills before I can even think about making that happen. The amp I use every day is made by the British hi-fi company Name, which is their Super Knight 1 from 2008. This integrated amp has 80 watts per channel, 
and contains a 24-bit digital to analog converter. It's a great sounding amp, which has served me faultlessly for 16 years now. Again, because of my limited space, which is in an attic room, by the way, I can only have small speakers. These are made by another British company called Neat Acoustics. These are their bi-wired Neat Petite SX bookshelf speakers, and they're just right for me. Being only bookshelf speakers, they are of course light on bass. So to help me with that, I have a Tannoy TS10 sub supplying me with all the low end I need. Now vinyl, as some of you don't tire of telling me, is an imperfect medium, and I get that, which is why I really enjoy playing around with tape. It's difficult to believe nowadays, but up until the early 1990s, tape was everywhere, and then suddenly it was gone. Fortunately, I managed to somehow keep hold of my cassette collection and even adding to it in the past few years. And I now have what I consider to be a pretty decent collection of classic cassettes, of which this is just a few. My main cassette playback machine is this Nakamichi BX300E from around 1982. I bought it as not working, but like many machines of this age, it just needed a tiny rubber idler tire, together with a bit of cleaning and grease to get it going again. But the cassette is just one of the many tape formats I still enjoy. One of the first memories I have of listening to music were random 60s pop tunes my father had recorded on this 1962 Stellaphone ST454, which was basically a Philips EL3541 in disguise. Although reel-to-reel -reel was a popular format back then, machines like this were owned mainly by grown-ups because they were expensive. This one cost 38 pounds back in 1962, which is the equivalent to a thousand pounds today. Many owners of reel-to-reel -reel machines back then were hobbyists, but they soon became popular among audiophiles, and record companies, EMI especially, began releasing albums from their catalogue available on that format. These first appeared in the late 1950s and were strictly classical titles. These low volume releases were copied in real time from the masters at seven and a half inches per second and sound amazing. It wasn't until the early 60s that pop titles started being produced. These ran at half the speed and had poor quality sound, but cost the same as their vinyl equivalent. However, unlike in the UK, some pop reels manufactured in the US and Japan were available in the 7.5 inches per second format and sound excellent. A couple of years ago, we made a dedicated video on the Beatles on Reel to Reel, a link to which is in the description. It's a format I still love listening to, but Stella here doesn't get much action these days. Instead, I have this four-track Revox A77, which is an end-of-the-line Mark IV from 1977. And this Revox B77 from 1982, which is a high-speed model which can run at 15 inches per second. Also, of course, in the background in this and nearly every other video on this channel is their daddy, the Revox G36, which is a twin track model from 1966. Unlike the other two Revoxes, it's a valve or tube powered machine, which runs at three and three quarters and seven and a half inches per second. And having been used less, is actually in overall better condition than the other two. However, the B77 is a great machine to record onto and a way to play back professionally recorded master tapes. Unfortunately, it won't play back my Sergeant Pepper master tape, which besides being recorded at 30 inches per second is on pancake reels, which are too large to load on it. Therefore, I'm having to find other ways of listening to these, which will be revealed hopefully next month. If you're an entrepreneur or creator looking to expand your business online, this video sponsor Squarespace can help. 
Setting up an online store couldn't be easier with Squarespace. Their award-winning templates and state-of-the-art drag-and-drop technology will help you make a stylish, responsive, and professional-looking website in minutes. With the Squarespace app, you can run your online store from anywhere, making it easy to track your inventory and connect with your customers while you're on the go. But an online store isn't just for physical goods. With Squarespace, you can make a website to sell services, subscriptions, or digital content, including video. Then use their built-in SEO, email campaigns, and social media tools to help you drive traffic to your online store and expand your business. So whether you're looking to set up an e-commerce store, book appointments, or sell your skills, Squarespace can help you make it happen. Want to find out more? Then head to squarespace.com for a free trial. And when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com forward slash parlogram to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Staying with tape, I also really enjoy 8-tracks, which I play on this mid-70s Akai CR81D, which, like the cassette player, came back to life after some simple maintenance, and now runs like a dream. Now, while it's true that a lot of 8-track cartridges can sound terrible, especially these green ones made in the UK by PRT, some, like these early 70s EMI ones in coloured shells, sound amazing. After you've changed the pads, of course, this Wings Wildlife cartridge, for example, is so hot and crunchy sounding, it's become my go-to when I want to listen to this album. It's true, it's not the most practical of formats with its clunky switchovers and tendency to get chewed up in some machines, but it's so much fun. I've even put one in my Vintage Rover, a video about which you can see elsewhere on the channel. CDs I occasionally listen to, but I mainly load them up onto the computer to store them and then listen to them from there. Although I listen mainly through speakers, I do sometimes enjoy listening on headphones. When I'm out and about, I use these AirPod Pros, but for listening at home, it's a different story. Now, headphones have come a long way since these AKG K150s from the 1960s, which look more like instruments of torture rather than headphones but by far the most comfortable headphones I've ever worn are these. They're called the 99 Classics, and they're from a Romanian audiophile company called Meze. Not only are they the most comfortable, but they might be the best looking too. I love this dark walnut finish and these gold accents, which are also available in silver. They have a fantastic rich and full bass and are overall a superbly musical and well-balanced set of headphones. Just the job when I want to kick back, relax, and enjoy the music. If that sounds like something you'd enjoy, simply click on the link in the description and take a look at them for yourself. And if you'd like to order them, just use the code PARLOGRAM20 for a 20% discount. Another question people are always asking me is, what's the story with this red telephone? Well, no, it's not the bat phone, but it did once occupy a similarly important place. This phone once sat on the desk of British Prime Minister Harold Wilson in No. 10 Downing Street. Born in Huddersfield, West Yorkshire in 1916, Harold Wilson achieved the rare feat of becoming the British Prime Minister twice. First, from October 1964 to June 1970, and then again from March 1974 to April 1976. He famously courted the Beatles when, in March 1964, he presented them with the Show Business Personalities of the Year for 1963 at the Variety Club Awards Ceremony at the Dorchester Hotel. But it was John Lennon's wit which made the headlines the next day when he called Wilson Mr Dobson and thanked him for the Purple Hearts. Now, Wilson died in 1995, but his wife Mary outlived him by 23 years. And when she died in 2018, her estate was sold at auction, and this phone was one of the lots, along with one of his trademark pipes and his record collection, which you can see me unboxing elsewhere on the channel. I really hope you enjoyed this short tour of my audio setup and a little bit of history too. I'll be back next week with some more Beatles-related content. But that's all for this one, so I'll say bye for now, and thanks for watching. <laughs>